in defense for a moment of the Board of Elections here in Houston. I want to say I couldn't find where I was supposed to vote either. <laughs> I was very confused in the primaries. Uh, I want to go over to Tony again. You were um, desk. You know, I think that based on the emails that that we're getting, and we we keep our email uh, firewall wide open so that we get as much input as we can. Um, we're getting emails that indicate to me that that this presidential election is going to be really ugly. It's going to get ugly. Mm -hmm. um, I think it already has, and I think that, yeah, the, you know, based on some of the emails that I've seen, um, you know, and I, I think that we, we might be forcing a discussion here on, on race with, you know, with, with Obama's candidacy that, that I think is, is going to get ugly, but I think it's ne needed and healthy, you know, and I think because people will expose themselves. The racists will expose themselves. They will, they will come out of the woodwork. Because, you know, I think that there's a large body of people in this country who would rather die than see a black man as president. Mm -hmm. You know, and they will come out and expose themselves. And I think that that, in a way, is, is, is going to be a good thing. I think, though, when, you know, when you talk about the, the, the Bird-Obama kind of dichotomy here, um, the, the kinds of people that, that thought it was okay to do, do what they did to, to Bird, you know, they, they live in the woods and they stay there and they, they you know, they, they don't come out. They, you know, they, they there. Um, but I think that on the, on the national level, at, 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 at any rate, I think we, some of the, the real virulent racists will, will expose themselves, and I think we'll see it. I will say that uh, preparing for this show, one of the questions that I was asked by a reporter was, do I believe the same thing that happened to James Byrd 10 years ago could happen today? And my answer back on that was, of course it could happen, because there are always individuals out there that are going to do the wrong thing, that are sick individuals. But will we react the same way is the difference. When James Byrd's murder happened, and correct me if I'm wrong, any of you that want to get in on this, it was then the reaction of the communities that it was no longer just three men had attacked one man. It was the white community had stepped down on the black community again and done a horrible thing. And what I would like to hope is that if it happened again today, it would be three sick white men did this to a black man. It's not a whole cultural thing. But I don't know that we're there yet. I don't think we're at that point where we can see that. But, Ernie. Uh, yes, Cherry. I, of course, on June the 2nd, I was with six of the Byrd family because we wanted to really put James Byrd back on the radar. Because for, for a long time, you know, we forgot about it. It happened. Been there, done it. You know, we owned other things. And so in doing so, to be able to look at a slide presentation or a PowerPoint presentation of the lynchings of so many black men in this country. But that's not what I really want to talk about. I want to talk about, you see, this sick mentality that drug James Byrd behind that pickup truck happened, what, three or four years ago to David Galvan? a teenager, and it happened by these young teenagers at a party, and even though David did not die that night, he committed suicide probably, two, uh, what, two and a half years later, but really, in essence, he did die, and I am really saddened that it was not a big enough outcry for David, you know, so when I look at that, here you have these teenagers, and we want to look at our teenagers, and we are saying the young people, you know, they're really supporting Obama, and we got this movement, but that was young people, that was teenagers did that to David. Mm -hmm. So when I look at this, only until every individual or the majority of individuals can say the only thing necessary for evil to exist is when good people do nothing. Mm -hmm. And too many good people sit on the sideline and watch. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Chief Hurt, I would say there are a lot of people out there who are going to say, stiffer crimes, stiffer penalties, that's going to take care of this problem. You can make the laws whatever you want, put these people away for a long time, but you're not getting at the root cause, correct? You're exactly right, because people look at the justice system and they say, well, why are the police officers uh, arresting this group of people or these people in this particular neighborhood or whatever? And we talk about justice and quality of life 
we need to go back to was there an opportunity for the family of those individuals to be successful? Okay, mm -hmm. did they get a good education? You have to go back and look at the dropout rate. The opportunities people had to learn and to interact with individuals throughout our cities and throughout this country. And, and then you make the decision that says, well, is, it, is that a good system? Because it just the system starts from the moment that we are born and how we are cared for and how we are supported and how we are uh, coached and uh, people cheerleading us long, along to success. And if you constantly are, are being dragged or people trying to drag you down with the negative part of it, it makes it very, very difficult. And it's happening today. Mm -hmm. Listen to some of the uh, news media. Don't mean to pick on a gentleman <laughs> over there. But let's go back to the Obama deal. When he won in the southern states, they said, oh, he won there because the majority African-Americans live in those communities. When he won in Iowa and Utah, he just won. <laughs> <laughs> he just won. Didn't say who voted for him there. He just won. Dr. Kleinberg? Uh, I, I think one of the things we're pointing to here is that it's not just the racial divide in this country that is critical and central to the future of, the, of America. It's a class divide. It's a growing, cutting off of opportunity in an increasingly unequal society. And so that's another central piece for us to address. But the other point I wanted to make also is that uh, there are going to be sick people uh, with us for eternity. Mm -hmm. uh, but the patterns in America are hopeful and positive. And, and you see it in the kinds of things we've been talking about with Obama and others, but you also see it in our surveys and in uh, the most powerful predictor among Anglos in attitudes toward African Americans and toward um, you know, whether this increasing ethnic diversity in Houston is a good thing or a bad thing and in perceptions of immigration, the single most powerful predictor is age. Younger Anglos are far more comfortable with this ethnic diversity than older Anglos. And I think that's part of what we're watching in a period of revolutionary change, that these things, that the, the, the trend, the direction in which we're moving is a positive one. With, with that's all one of the these. questions that I have here. Is, is our conversation coming a little late? Is the problem going to be solved with the next generation that's coming up that are already seeing things different? Or is it... I'll get to you in one second because I promised the judge I would go to her a minute ago, even though I've changed the topics. I'll go over there. Well, I, you know, I was going to say about the, the fact that with the Obama thing, we're still thinking in the us and them type of mode. Uh, I've seen, you know, I was pretty involved in the Democratic Party um, um, convention and, and everything, and, uh, and I could see that there were excesses on both sides uh, of the Hillary and Obama uh, uh, side of the equation, and uh, and, I, and it was saddening to me. Talk about something sad, uh, you know how there were so many statements of, you know, them blacks are blankety blank, them Mexicans are blankety blank, or those whites, you know, they'll never vote for, you know, they'll rather die than, you know, and that sort of thing. And it was really sad to see, even within a party that is supposed to have common ground and uh, and so if there's ever going to be any kind of dialogue it first start has to start with some of those people and some of them and some of the others but not you know in terms of you know the race right. uh, thing you know this race as opposed to the other and second the the question uh, of whether it's just a matter of it's going to heal itself I think little by little it will um, it, it'll take a long time, but, but really I see my, my children, uh, and as opposed to the older generation, I see their generation, and really there is so much less, so much less racism. They speak uh, very, um, you know, sometimes I, I'm taken aback by the words they use because they do see color, but not as a distinction. They see it as, well, you know, you're blonde and you're not, and, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, you have long nails and, and the other one doesn't. I mean, they don't really see it as a, as a mark of, of privilege or lack of privilege. They see it more as a, you know, we're all the same but different, and they kid about that. And right. so it, it's really, to me, it's, it's hope, you know. I think it was Chief Hurt. You'd and I'm going to go back to somebody said, well, the, the younger generation began to react and see it different, mm -hmm. that they're doing better. I'm going to share a story with you. And uh, 
it wasn't here at Houston, but uh, I was a uh, police chief at a function. Officers had their families there, and Anglo officer came over and introduced his young son. Says, uh, this is the police chief. It's my boss. And the kid, I guess he's probably five or six years old, he says, well, you can't be a police chief. Now, somebody taught him something <laughs> along the way. And this was five or six years old. So, you know, I don't know if all that progress we're talking about occurring is really occurring. <laughs> but know. can't there be different, <laughs> different reactions to those statements? I mean, yes, he can see a difference. And yes, he might have been taught. But if his motivation isn't necessarily negative, if it's just... He's surprised. surprised to see a man of color in a position Why of power. Why should he be surprised? I went to the same school that his uh, father did. I graduated from the same university that his father did. Why should he be surprised? Well, he should, he should be surprised. Everyone wants the answer. He should be surprised. It's unusual. And I think that's the key. You will always have racism until it is no longer unusual, until it becomes part of the taken-for-granted reality that... Color is not a factor. Okay, I promised over here, Carol, we'll get to her, and then I'll come back over there. I'm trying to keep track of you all. That's right. Uh, Well, the way I see racism, it's going to take a while. Yes, there's hope. There's always hope. I I always think back. I said, gosh, look how long it took us to be uh, our forefathers to be freed as slaves. How many years? Then between being free as slaves, look how long it took for the Civil Rights Bill to pass, so we can have rights to go wherever we want. I hope it won't take that as long as for the races to erase itself from our society because it seems like right here in Houston, we are still having major problems to have us as African American to reflect back to the days before the uh, uh, civil rights. And that's the hanging noose that are being displayed all around the country. Mm -hmm. And that's another thing in order to try to intimidate us. Uh, so in, in these people, this is all in hatred hatred for the African-American community. And I agree with the Ernie here. There, there are a lot of things on the block that is talking about Obama now that is highly uh, derogatory, racism, and hatred. I mean just outright hatred for a black man uh, to leave this country. And I, I think that we have to talk about it. We have to continue to keep it on the forefront. And we're going to have to talk about Pacific instance. Uh, I, I, I recall the uh, instance where uh, as President of NWCP, a parent called me. She said, Ms. Galloway, is there something we can do about these constables? I didn't precinct four, uh, it was, said that uh, her son, who dates a white young lady, uh, they go to school together, they were seniors, and they were sitting uh, in the car he uh, had uh, dropped her off to her aunt's house or somebody. He was the constable drove through the apartment project, uh, a, a project, uh, well, a project the apartment uh, unit, totally. and saw uh, them, and yanked the young man out of the car, and 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 he immediately called his mother, and he asked her. He assumed that it was some criminal activity he had going, and he wanted to arrest her. He immediately called his parents. They was not that far, lived, in, lived that far away, came there and uh, uh, to find out, along with the young lady's mother, because they was neighbor in the subdivision, and the, her parent came to Anglo. And their parents are just like uh, sisters and brothers. All, I mean, their relationship very close. And so uh, they had to tell this office, this is a fine young man from a very fine family. My daughter dates him. And so, uh, and the Anglo parent chewed out the Anglo constable and told him <laughs> he was going to report it. But the black parent wanted to know if anything they could do for his discrimination against her son and uh, 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 target him because he was African American. And so these are things that come in. We, I hear all kinds of stories. Right. But we got to talk about it. We got to bring it to the end. I Let identify. Me, I'm going to go out a bit on a limb on this one. Let's see how the reaction is to this. I'm going to go to Reverend Lawson on it. Uh, what about the theory, the idea, a cornered animal reacts more vi violently. They're, they're scared. Are we at a point where maybe these racist thoughts are because the tide seems to be turning in some way that those that are holding so fast and true to these old beliefs are striking out bigger, broader, because they're just about to be snuffed out. Is there any hope in that kind of a way of looking at it? 
All of us have to realize that racism is real, it is long-lived, it probably is still going to be long-lived. I don't think, that, I don't think that, that that's going to change very rapidly. I think that one of the things, and I guess Chief, Chief Hurt spoke to it, is that the media helps to keep that going. But I also think that, uh, as I think of South Africa, I can remember Nelson Mandela coming out of prison to, to, to become the president, and when he became president, he chose the, the, the former president to be his vice president. That kind of thing says a whole lot. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that, that things are going to change rapidly, mm -hmm. but I want to frankly salute Channel 8 for just holding this, this kind of dialogue mm -hmm. where, where we can get together, we can, we can agree, we, we can disagree, but we all have to realize that this is a monster that has to be faced. Mm -hmm. Recently, I was speaking to, yeah, you can applaud if you'd like. I don't want to stop that. Recently, I was talking to a group of college students, and one of the students asked me, isn't it racist to say, I am voting for Barack Obama because he is black? Is that not the same thing as somebody else saying they're not going to vote for him because he is? Isn't it two sides of the same coin? I throw that out to anybody who wants to. Uh, I would like very much to say <laughs> okay. something about that. You know, it's very interesting to me in, of course, the work that I do, and I have heard so many stories when people have the freedom to really be able to purge themselves, if you want to use that word. And one of the things that I find so amazing, when we are talking about racism, 99% of the time, we're not even talking about the same thing. You know, if I don't like broccoli, somebody's going to say I'm racist. <laughs> you know, and so what, and when I say we talk about racism, I'm talking about an institution. I'm talking about an institution that was created, yes. an institution that bestowed goodies on some and kept a whole lot of others from getting the goodies. I'm talking about an institutional form that operates on power as well as prejudice. Yes. So when I'm using that definition, what you just put on the flow K-5, you see, <laughs> or that dog K-hunt, whatever yeah. you want to say. So the thing of it is that when, and for me, to be able to look very carefully. I don't want to vote for anybody just because they're a woman, and I didn't want to vote for anyone just because they were black. I didn't want to do that, and I wanted to really examine the issues. But hypothetically, now, let's say I'm going to vote for somebody just because he's black. Well, right now, when I'm talking about an institution of racism as an institution based on power, functioning on prejudice, the bottom line is what people still don't realize, we're on the way, Stephen. We are on the way to this making everything kind of look better, better okay? <laughs> but the thing of it is, people of color still in this country have little or no power. Yeah. And mm -hmm. if racism operates under power, yeah. Then, right. for me to go and vote for a black man, hell, I'm just voting for a black man. <laughs> <laughs> Chief Hurt, over to you. Yeah, I, I just, a uh, couple, two, two points. And he says, well, it's getting better. It's not like it was three years ago. But I guess my question is, how long? Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? How much longer yeah. not in do we our have generation. to go? Not in yeah. Why not? That's no. it. Why not? That is that, that's it. <laughs> no, I, I, it's, okay, I mean, over to Stephen. If we have, as we very well might, the President of the United States being this extraordinary African-American person, that's going to have some enormous impact on the speed with which we move in that direction. I, mean, I, I, think, I think there's a legitimate sense that he can bring something of extraordinary importance that a white person could not bring but to that office. But can't he cause backlash, too? Can it be then a lot of the white establishment who sees a black man in power is frightened by that, so they build up and build up their... The, before... <laughs> I, I, okay, I, I, I got to say this right quick. I'm sorry to be in room. But you, you hear certain uh, radio show hosts got this Obama derailment train every day. That's mm -hmm. what we're going to do. The rest of the day we're going to get rid of it. Even the other thing is, says, well, this, and the other point I wanted to make is, says, this black man that's running for president, isn't his mother white? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What if we didn't see a picture and his name was Richard Smith 
and we only knew about what he wanted to do and what his dream was as a leader of this country and probably one of the most powerful men in the, in the world. And we didn't know. And everybody says, the black man. His mother must be saying, well, well what about me? <laughs> what happened to me in this discussion? You know, what about, what about me in this discussion? You know, instead of, and, and I don't know, and I, I do know why we say that, because it says, well, if you have one drop, you are. Okay. <laughs> And, but, but, the, I, but I think I would have hoped by this time, and I know, says, you know, how long, and uh, I don't know if we all can wait that long okay. uh, for things to, to make those significant changes. And, and I think one of the things, if we're going to make those changes, I like to speed the process up. And I would, too. So I'm going to jump in here and say, <laughs> I've been told we've got about five minutes left. And so I want to turn this whole conversation real quick into one of hope for the future. What is it we all can be doing that can help speed this process along, that can get us so that we're not, yeah, maybe we'll see color, but that that isn't a negative thing, that it isn't stereotypical examples go with the color of someone's skin, that we're all just people in the world. I'm going to start with Carol Mims Galloway. Uh, well, I think one of the things, the tools that African Americans are going to need, they're going to have to get economic power. Economic power will uh, eradicate a lot of this. Uh, and uh, because this is where we are not, we haven't obtained is economic power. And, and uh, I know one of my kids asked me, they, it, she says, Mother, uh, what are we going to do? Uh, how come there's so much racism in the country? How can we get rid of it? I said, baby, I said, let me be frank. The only way we're going to get rid of racism, everybody going to have to marry everybody else so there's no race. <laughs> <laughs> I say, and, and I, I remember a story uh, uh, that Congressman uh, Alexander Green, uh, in a speech he made, he came and spoke at an event, and he said that people do not realize that we're all related Adam and Eve were supposed to be the first on earth. If they was the only two, then we all are cousins. Mm -hmm. So why are we being discriminatory against each other? So, I mean, once again, there is hope, and I guess you have my solution. <laughs> and I wonder where we would be if you had no children, because they're giving us our best stories tonight. So, thank you. Reverend Lawson, what would you say to this? I guess most of all, I would say that, that we're going to need to be proactive in, 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 in reaching across that, that divide, uh, rather than to wait un, un, until there is some dialogue, we actually need, need to push into it. That's why I would celebrate what this show does. Uh, chances are that, that we would need not to be on one side of the classroom, but, but to move over to the other side, and, 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 and not to move into the dining hall and eat all by ourselves, but just deliberately go over and get with uh, somebody uh, who, who, is, who, is not, who is not just like us. I think that, I think that we will have to be proactive. Mm -hmm. Judge? I think the success of this uh, lies in our youth. I think going back to the schools, teaching diversity, teaching, mm -hmm. you know, understanding, tolerance, um, you know that sort of thing. I think that's important thing. In, in a sense, you know, and I, I shouldn't have interrupted you, and I, I apologize. <laughs> I said not in this generation. It's not going to happen. I mean, we're trying our best. You know, those who want to try, but really, really, the success is in our youth. Let's try to teach them in the schools, starting tomorrow. You know, if we can. Yeah. Okay, Dr. Warren, I'm running tight on time, so I might not get to everyone. Okay, but. I just think we have to keep our eye on the ball and we'll make coalitions about things that really count, like health insurance, national health insurance, um, because if, um, if we don't understand that this is about privilege and power and economics, then we're going to be tricked, and mm -hmm. that worries me. So it seems to me that that's, we really need to uh, work together for those common goals. Okay, I'm going to be very democratic here. I've been given one minute left. Who wants to take my last okay. one? Oh, Stephen Kleinberg, <laughs> hand up first. Okay. Uh, I think the key is, is what all of you have been saying. The two things is one is it's an issue of an inequality. It's an issue of 49 million Americans with no health insurance. It's a question of, of inadequate schools and opportunities, and that has to be addressed directly for all of us. 
And the other piece is that uh, we're in the midst of this revolution. Now, I keep wanting to remind us of that. In Harris County, Texas today, of everybody in the Harris County who is 60 years old or older, 70% are Anglos. And of everybody under the age of 30, 75% are non-Anglos. It is a done deal. You will watch this transformation take place. And as we move into a world of greater equality and opportunity for all of us and where African Americans and Latinos are a part of the, the, the world of privilege and the world of leadership that is going to be inevitable as we go forward, I think much of this is going to be resolved. Chief, I'll give you 10 seconds. Just quick. And then, Chair, I'll give you 10. Go. People are in place to do that now. CEOs of major corporations, governors, congressmen, congresswomen, all over, they can make the decision to change this. You watch and see. We will come up to an answer to the fuel problem. We can come up with an answer to this, too. Cherry, jump on real quick. I would like very much for every individual in the United States that ever said that racism is over with to stop it and to even just look at the possibility. The second thing, I don't want to hear about your friends or your job and in your school and whatever. I want to know who sat around your kitchen table. I want your life to look like the well, city I of Houston. Right. Sit around Thank your you. kitchen table. They're telling me I'm out. All I can say is read more. Join the conversation at HoustonPBS.org slash race. There you can find out you can get a copy of this program for your school group or community group. For everyone at Houston PBS, for our wonderful panel, thank you all. I'm Ernie Manus. One more time, HoustonPBS.org slash race. Join the conversation. Thank you. <laughs>